Our first speaker is Anna Sophie Lorin. She's doing her PhD at University of Montreal under the supervision of Arlene Kahn. Today, she will tell us her work on the mechanisms that might explain how we can perceive the world as stable despite our constant eye movements. And her recent work from Khan Lab will be shared in the uh, chat shortly. Uh, stage is yours, Anna. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here today. I'll share my screen. Okay. So in this presentation, I'll explore the role of predictive mechanisms and more specifically, pre-saccadic attention in perceptual stability across saccades. So despite our impressions, we only see the world in small snapshots with the center in high definition and in color with all the surroundings blurred and dark. So we must constantly move our eyes from one point to another and then to another to encompass the whole scene. And this is done with very fast eye movements that we call saccades. And this causes images on the retina to move constantly. And yet we still perceive the world as stable and we believe we can see entire scenes at a glance. So this paradox is called perceptual stability. And the question remains, uh, how is it achieved? So it has been suggested that it might actually rely on predictive mechanisms. So before we move our eyes, we make predictions about the view after the second. And then after we move the eyes, we compare visual information obtained before and after the second. To do that, we must first displace our covered visual attention in the periphery to acquire information and hold it in our memory for future comparison. This facilitates perception and is called pre-saccadic attentional facilitation where discrimination at um, the peripheral goal location uh, of a saccade is enhanced. So now the question is, does pre-saccadic attention uh, help perceptual stability? If so, we presume that its role would be to make accurate predictions about our perception once the saccade is made. So we explored this in two main experiments, but first we had to have a measure of pre-saccadic attentional facilitation. So to do that, we implemented a dual task paradigm with an eye tracker, which recorded participants' gaze. So first they were fixating a dot surrounded by six figure eight, as you can see on the right, uh, on the left. And then we asked them to make a saccade to one of the figures as soon as the dot would turn into an arrow, indicating which figure to look at. And then the second goal was to discriminate between four letters called the discrimination symbol. And it would appear for a very, very short time just before the saccade, right here. And if the task worked, it's only because participants' pre-saccadic attention was already di directed to the target that they could successfully discriminate the letter. Their pre-saccadic attentional facilitation would allow them to perceive the target's identity. But that would be the case only in 50% of the trial where the discrimination symbol would appear actually at the saccadic goal. In the other 50% of the time, it would appear elsewhere to any other placeholder. So first we only compared participants' discrimination performance between the valid position where the letter to discriminate appeared at the saccadic goal and invalid positions where it appeared elsewhere. So we can see here that participants were much better when the discrimination symbol was at the saccadic goal. This confirms that our task really measures um, pre-saccadic attentional facilitation. We can distinguish a target much better if we're about to saccad to it. We can also see that performance is at chance level uh, in invalid positions. So we'll be more interested in valid conditions from now on. So anyway, this solid effects replicates previous findings on pre-saccadic attentional facilitation. So now that we are sure we are manipulating the right variable, the next goal was to determine if changes occurring after a saccade could influence pre-saccadic attention. So what happens after a saccade should be irrelevant to a pre-saccadic task. If it's not, we would assume that pre-saccadic attention is involved in the comparison between the pre and post-saccadic perception. So whether we retain pre-saccadic information or not, would depend on the correspondence between pre and post saccadic images indicating a stable world. So to resume, uh, if pre saccadic attention is involved in comparing pre and post saccadic information, a change in, in a post saccadic change should disrupt these comparisons, which in turn should disrupt pre saccadic attention. In, on the other hand, if pre saccadic attention is not involved in these comparisons, post saccadic changes are not relevant and should not change anything. 
So we measured pre-saccadic attention again, but we had four different conditions to induce post-saccadic changes. So in the baseline, nothing changed after the saccade, and that constituted our comparison standard, which should yield the highest discrimination performance. Then in the all-off condition, all possible placeholder disappeared right after the saccade. Next, in the one-off condition, only the discrimination symbol disappeared, which was also the saccadic goal when it was in the valid position. And finally, in the one-on condition, it was the opposite. So only the discrimination symbol remained after the saccade and all other placeholders disappeared. So then we compared discrimination performance across all conditions. And we saw that the one-off condition where only the discrimination symbol disappeared while every other placeholder remained was associated with a lower performance, none other than, uh, not only than the baseline, but also uh, all other conditions. And we did not see uh, any difference between any other conditions and baseline. So this was a little surprising for the all of condition because the, dis uh, the discrimination symbol also disappeared here. But to explain this result, we assume that in this case, the situation was more comparable to a blink. So if there is no comparison to make between pre and post uh, saccadic scenery, there is no judgment to make about perceptual stability. So we saw that pre saccadic discrimination performance was only disrupted when its target disappeared, but without its surroundings. So it was expected that its disappearance should impact performance. Uh, but as we saw with other conditions, these findings are inconsistent with an explanation of a large change in the scenery disrupting memory, but rather they suggest that changing a second specific target location can disrupt pre-saccadic expectations about said target. So this brings us to experiment two, where we shifted the target instead of causing it to disappear. So along the same logic, a shifted target should impact performance because it does not coincide with the predicted expectation of its location before the saccade. However, saccades are noisy. They do not always land exactly where we want them to. And more importantly, our brain is perfectly aware of this variability and take it into account. So saccade variability, saccade variability should also play a role as well with discrimination symbol shifts disrupting performance, but only when shifted outside of the normal saccade variability. So in this experiment, we had two main conditions. In the first, the discrimination symbol was shifted parallel to the second from three degrees inwards to three degrees outwards. And we have an example here. And in the second uh, condition, the discrimination symbol was shifted perpendicular to the second from 20 degrees counterclockwise to 20 degrees clockwise. And we compared these performances between baseline and these conditions, while also taking into account second variability, looking at participants' second landing positions. So first we looked at the distribution of participants' saccade start and end positions. And we can see that there is variability around the figures and it did not change between uh, the conditions. So in previous studies, there, there was evidence of more variability parallel to saccade vector compared to perpendicular, but not so much for oblique, oblique targets where uh, evidence is less clear. And indeed we can see here that uh, it forms an elliptic region parallel to the saccade uh, but it's uh, less pronounced in oblique position, even though we can still see it a little. So next we compared performance for every parallel discrimination symbol shift. Of course, the zero degree shift corresponds to baseline. And you can see on the right that we also compared uh, the participants distribution of their saccade amplitudes to the target's actual position along with their performance. So first we saw that performance was lower when the discrimination symbol was shifted three degree inwards and for all its outward shifts. On the right, we can see that the saccades were slightly undershooted in general. The baseline corresponds to the target's initial, initial position at 5.8 degrees from fixation point, And the majority of saccades landed slightly inwards with the mean at 5.4 degrees from fixation. We can also see that a higher proportion of saccades landed one degree inwards compared to one degree outwards. So this could explain the performance results that we have here. Next, we looked at the same parameters, but with, but with perpendicular target shifts. And this time, we saw a performance decrease for all target shifts compared to baseline. And this is understandable because, as I said before, saccadic variability formed an elliptic distribution parallel to the second. And perpendicular shifts, as we see on the right, were much more likely to fall outside the participants' saccad variability ranges. So to resume this experiment, we saw that pre-saccadic discrimination performance decreased with target shifts in a similar manner to their, their disappearance. We also observed that their performance was linked to their saccade variability because 
small shifts landing into their endpoint range was associated with better performance compared to bigger shifts. So in conclusion, in experiment one, we saw that only changes to the saccadic goal where pre-saccadic attention was directed, disrupted performance, but only for condition where every other placeholder remained. And in experiment two, we saw that performance was disrupted by most target shifts and was linked to saccad variability. So these results lead us to conclude that pre-saccadic information is more likely to be disrupted when we perceive a change, a change in a target's position, but within the same scene. So these findings suggest that pre-saccadic attentional facilitation indeed plays a role in predictive mechanisms for, for perceptual stability. So I want to thank all of my collaborators for this project and thank you for your attention throughout this presentation. And of course, I welcome any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you, Anna-Sophie. This, this is a beautiful talk. And uh, for our aud audience, please ask your questions in the question and answer panel for Anna for uh, for the yeah for the details or any discussions she would she 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 would like to you want her to answer. We have one questions for you, and Megan Peters is asking, could the differences if you click the question and answer down yeah. and you will be able to see it. Could mm -hmm. the difference between everything disappearing and only the target disappearing have anything to do with the initial encoding in the periphery being subject to crowding and thus the creations of inference, interference? This is not a well for questions yet. Yeah. Uh, just being subject to crowding. Uh, well, we saw with different conditions. Uh, initially, the information, pre saccadic attention with the information acquired with pre-saccadic attention was well encoded. And then uh, the difference between everything disappearing and just the placeholder disappearing, we expected to be, since it's a larger change, a, a much bigger change when everything disappeared, we expected that it would disrupt performance even more if it was like just a memory thing but it's actually the opposite. So yeah, perceptually we perceive less of a change when only the, the discrimination symbol disappears. So I hope it answered the question. It, it's not like surely she's, it can't be this, but yeah, it, yeah. it's our... She is basically wondering the interaction with the iconic mem memory and the crowding. Maybe you know the interaction between these these two things is just like appearing some change in the people, that, you know, saccade dynamics. That's mm -hmm. why she, you know, yeah, wanted to ask and clarify. Yeah, we we just weren't interpreting that um, changing only the the discrimination symbol would create more crowding, but yeah, it, it's possible. Okay, thank you. We have another question for you from yeah. Priyanka. Priyanka says, it's a great talk. Thank you. Have you Thank looked you. at performance as a function of time of change offset relative to saccade onset? Do you see any signatures of the saccadic suppression? Um, well, performance as a function of time change offset. Uh, well, everything um, was made very uh, quickly. So it's the participant saccade that, um, that would create the change. So as soon as the participants started their saccad, and this was calculated with a velocity um, criterion. So, so yeah, so as, as soon as they made a saccad, the, 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 the scenery would change. So the change offset, I don't really, I'm not really sure what you mean by the change offset. Priyanka, could you please clarify your question for us? Yep. Do you think this uncertainty might be, you know, you are changing two things in the stimuli and maybe this uncertainty affects it one, one more than other for, for these features. And what we see in this case, I don't know. I'm just like speculating because you have interesting results. Yeah, yeah. do you think it is related to the uncertainty in the stimuli? Sorry, could you repeat the question? I mean. Yeah, I'm, I'm just wondering, you know, you are playing with different aspects of the stimuli and then yeah. one is much 
has stronger effect than the other. Yeah. I'm just wondering maybe that these features of the stimuli affecting the saccade more than others because it causes more uncertainty for participants. Mm -hmm. You see what I mean? I, I'm just like wondering, can it be due to the correlation with the uncertainty in the stimuli? Yeah, it can be that too, because yeah, it's, uh, it's true that um, with everything else remaining the same, it can create more confusion. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Anna. Now we are you just, I mean, feel free to ask more questions to Anna. She's around for, throughout the sessions and she will be happy to answer your questions in the question and answer panel. Thank you. It is a lovely talk and beautiful thank results. Thank you. Now, now we will move to our next speaker, Alex Hernandez.